Final Fantasy VII was a pioneering game. It helped to revolutionise the gaming industry by introducing a plethora of unforgettable features relating to its gameplay, visuals and storyline. But amongst the myriad of innovative mechanics and memorable moments, one of the most captivating aspects of Final Fantasy VII was its eclectic cast of characters and the intriguing and emotional elements that connected them to one another. Much of the cast came together as a result of the oppression they suffered at the hands of the Shinra Electric Power Company. Their varied origins and individual experiences then enriched the group's dynamic, making for quite the ragtag cast of characters. But even though they all hailed from different backgrounds, the connections and similar elements between each of the characters would run deep. These links were quite visible amongst the main party, and there was a clear narrative connection between Cloud and Sephiroth, the main antagonist. As the plot developed, the viewer was pushed into thinking that these two characters were the very antithesis of one another. Sephiroth was pure evil, and in that regard, he was unlike any other. But perhaps the most intriguing and extraordinary element is that amongst the playable cast, there was one character who did share some similar traits to Sephiroth, they just manifested in different ways. And when you dig a bit deeper, there are some pretty chilling parallels that exist between Sephiroth and Aerith Gainsborough. It's a well-known fact that Aerith's death at the hands of Sephiroth was an incredibly shocking moment. It would send ripples through the entire gaming landscape, becoming one of the most memorable and famous scenes in video gaming history. Its impact was such that fans in Japan would even draft a petition requesting Aerith's revival. For many, the death scene between Aerith and Sephiroth is often the primary focus when discussing their relationship. But in truth, when taking a closer look at the two characters, there are deeper, underlying parallels that do exist, even if, on the surface, they may seem like polar opposites. After all, Aerith was a kind-hearted, gentle flower girl, and Sephiroth was a ruthless antagonist driven by a desire for power and control. But despite their contrasting personalities, a closer examination of their lives as a whole reveals a series of striking similarities. Through the progression of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, we would learn that both Aerith and Sephiroth were born with unique abilities, and their backgrounds would set them apart from the rest of the cast. Their respective connections to the planet's life force, the livestream, would also play a crucial role in shaping their lives and the overall narrative of the game. Furthermore, their tumultuous pasts, marked with both loss and tragedy, shaped their personalities and motivations in ways that often mirrored each other. Notably, both characters were also considered outsiders by their peers and the world around them. Aerith, due to her Cetra heritage, held a unique understanding of the planet that others could not comprehend, and Sephiroth, with his Genova-infused cells, possessed abilities and powers that others could not fathom, leading him to view himself as superior and separate from humanity. In exploring their stories, it's fascinating to see how these similarities will create a complex web of connections between the two characters. These multiple associations and parallels highlight the writer's diligent attention to character development, further emphasising their importance within the overarching narrative and the world of Final Fantasy VII. And it feels that throughout the Final Fantasy VII Remake project, these notions will be pushed even harder. But before exploring these chilling similarities and links in more detail, we first need to go back to the very beginning, to the roots of Aerith and Sephiroth as characters during the game's earliest stages of development. Final Fantasy VII had a very fluid development cycle. Very little was set in stone, and the leadership team were encouraged to explore ideas following strands to see where they would end up. This meant there was a lot of evolution when it came to the narrative, but examining the initial concepts provide insight into the different thought processes, while also highlighting elements that held significant weight when looking at the project as a whole. Such could be said about the creation and development of Aerith and Sephiroth's characters, as well as their respective roles in the overarching story. From the beginning, Aerith and Sephiroth were envisioned as pivotal characters. The first concept revolved around Aerith and Sephiroth being siblings, this could be seen in their character designs, with Tetsuya and Omura giving them the same heavily segmented bangs. At some point, this was not deemed viable for the story they wanted to tell, so the narrative concept would undergo a transformation. This would see Aerith and Sephiroth envisioned as romantic partners, with specific plot points adjusted to reflect this idea. 
However, it wasn't until later in the development process that the team decided to revise this concept once more, introducing a new character, Zack Fair, as Aerith's previous love interest and Cloud's close companion. As such, this connection with Sephiroth would be discarded, never making it into the game. Despite the abandonment of a more concrete relationship between Aerith and Sephiroth, it was evident from the initial concepts that the developers aimed to establish a significant and meaningful connection between the two characters, underscoring the importance of their parallels in Final Fantasy VII. Therefore, from the foundational stages of the game's development, the ties between these two characters have been a critical aspect and focal point. And while they were not siblings or lovers in the final product, Aerith and Sephiroth shared remarkably similar backgrounds and situations. Both characters, for example, were not entirely human, and they would both have parents who were associated with Shimra's science and research division. As the child of Professor Garst Faramis and Ephelna, Aerith was half Cetra, half human. In contrast, Sephiroth had two human parents, Professor Hojo and Lucrezia Crescent. But in the name of science, they decided to inject Sephiroth with Genova cells while he was still inside Lucrezia's womb. Due to a combination of who their parents were and the DNA they inherited, both Aerith and Sephiroth would have unique genetic makeups. This would make them scientific marvels, as there were no other beings on the planet who could claim the same heritage. As a consequence, each would possess incredible powers that could not be replicated elsewhere. In the case of Aerith, Ifelna was the only other known Cetra, but she was pure-blooded. And although Aerith would inherit the intimate link to the planet, allowing her to effectively communicate with it, it's unclear whether her humanity would have enhanced or inhibited these powers. Sephiroth would also gain an intimate connection with something much greater, Genova. But in addition, he would gain abnormal strength and durability. There were those who possessed similar powers in the form of Angeal Huli and Genesis Rhapsodus but due to how they acquired Genova's DNA, they did not possess the same powers. As a result of who they were, both Aerith and Sephiroth would grow up as active science experiments, and they would do so in parallel inside the Shinra headquarters. The only difference was that while Aerith became aware of her imprisonment, Sephiroth did not. After leaving Shinra and learning the true nature of Genova, Garst did everything he could to live off the grid. These feelings were heightened following the birth of Aerith, Deep down, he would have known that Shinra would one day come, and that when they did, he would be powerless to stop them. When that day came, Ifalna and Aerith were ripped from his dying arms and taken back to Shinra as lab specimens. Hojo would be the overseeing scientist, and although he left Aerith alone, as she was deemed an inferior half-breed, Ifalna was forced to undergo painful and inhumane experiments that drained her spirit and took a noticeable toll on her physical well-being. As Aerith grew and became more aware of what was happening, this placed her under a lot of stress. It would see her become plagued by mental health issues, and once Aerith herself began to manifest powers as a Cetra, these issues only exacerbated. After escaping from the Shinra headquarters, Aerith would be given the illusion of freedom. There was a belief that due to how much suffering Aerith had endured, using a heavy hand would not be conducive to positive results. Instead, the Turks were given the green light to take a softer approach. This would see Aerith placed under constant observation, but instead of acting as oppressors, they would act more as friends. The hope was that Aerith may come to trust them, and if that were the case, then she may end up wanting to assist Shinra with their research as opposed to being forced. This scenario would parallel the situation Shinra had manufactured for Sephiroth. As the child of Hojo and Lucrezia, Sephiroth was always going to be subjected to a life of experimentation. He was taken away from his mother immediately after birth and was never given the opportunity to even know who his parents were. From day one, Sephiroth was studied, and after quickly recognising his exceptional physical abilities, this only became more heightened. It would see Sephiroth raised to become a superhuman weapon or soldier, and although specific details about his childhood have yet to be disclosed, it can be inferred that his upbringing lacked any solid nurturing. Instead, there was a primary focus on rigorous combat training and testing limits. We're led to believe that Sephiroth thrived in this environment as he wanted to pass any tests that were placed in front of him. As such, he was a willing participant, but he was likely unaware of the extent of what was going on, and this charade would have only been assisted by the presence of Angeal and Genesis as it created healthy competition. Despite Sephiroth striking up a strong sense of camaraderie with those two, he struggled to make meaningful connections with anyone else, and would often be isolated due to his special talents. 
and this would only be exacerbated by the fame he gained during the Wutai War, as regular soldiers within Shinra treated him like some kind of celebrity. Aerith did not have the same standing in life, but she too would struggle to make meaningful connections. Within the slums, she was often labelled as odd or eerie due to her peculiar abilities, and the impact it had on her relationships. Her struggles in connecting with others would also stem from the emotional solitude she faced from being different. During this time, Aerith was raised by Almira. Another odd parallel, because it would mean that both Aerith and Sephiroth would be raised for large portions of their life by people who were not their real parents. The main difference was that Almira was a kind and caring lady, whereas Sephiroth grew up surrounded by vultures like President Shinra. As the pair grew, they would become more attuned to their powers, and this would lead to uncomfortable scenarios. Aerith, for example, would be able to sense the death of Elmira's husband before official confirmation was received, and it's implied that she knew of Zack's death. These occurrences helped to emphasise that she was different. Sephiroth would have similar experiences. For some time, he had felt superior to his colleagues, with Angeal and Genesis the only ones able to keep up. But when fighting within the Shimmer combat simulator, he injured Genesis by accident. When Sephiroth offered his aid, it was rejected, and this began to sow seeds that there was something inherently different about him. The other intriguing parallels relate to the livestream, as they would both have a deep connection with the lifeblood of the planet. But due to everything that happened in their lives up until the point that they interacted with the substance, they would end up diverging and taking very different paths. At varying points in the story, both Aerith and Sephiroth would end up receiving mortal blows. These would, in perhaps an odd twist of fate, both be dealt by swords, and the manoeuvre would be eerily similar, a thrust from the back that would pierce through their chests. After falling into the livestream shortly after these two attacks, their physical forms would be destroyed, but both Aerith and Sephiroth would use their force of will to prevent their spirits from being absorbed. And this was where the seemingly eternal battle between Aerith and Sephiroth would begin, with each one trying to outfox the other. It would see Aerith seek to use the livestream to protect and preserve the planet, with Sephiroth seeking to find ways to exploit its power and bring about destruction. Perhaps the most noticeable instance of this came when Meteor was summoned. Aerith used the livestream to bolster the power of Holy and succeeded after Sephiroth's will was weakened in the North Crater. But as a backup plan, Sephiroth used the livestream to spread Genova's remnants across the planet, creating Geostigma. This conflict would be partially resolved with Infant Children and then Dirge of Cerberus. But with the Final Fantasy VII Remake project now seeming to further this conflict, it will be fascinating to see how the eternal struggle continues and then hopefully resolves. But for now, we hope you've enjoyed this video essay looking at the chilling parallels that exist between Aerith and Sephiroth. If you'd like us to look at some other characters in the future, please leave suggestions in the comments, and if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving us a like. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galsian Dikujata, Gregory, Justin Dent and Zukun TDK, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.